Mike LaFleur is out as Jets offensive coordinator. The news broke Wednesday that the Jets will be looking for a new coach to run their offense. We'll talk about the decision to move on from LaFleur and where the Jets go from here today on the Locked On Jets podcast. You are Locked On Jets, your daily New York Jets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, this is the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It is Thursday, January 12th, 2023, and I'm your host, John B. from GangreenNation.com. Thanking you for making the show your first listen or first watch every day. This podcast is free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. If you like what you see or here, hit the subscribe button where you are watching or listening so that you'll never miss an episode. If you're listening on a podcast source, please give the show a five-star review. If you're watching on YouTube, please give this episode a big thumbs up. These things help the channel out and help other Jets fans find the podcast. Today's episode of Locked on Jets is presented by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. Pick two to five players, and if they score more or less than their prize picks projection, you can win up to 10 times your money on any entry. First-time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code Locked On. That's prizepicks.com, promo code Locked On. And on today's show, we are going to talk about a major development from Wednesday for the New York Jets. The Jets will be looking for a new offensive coordinator as the team and Mike LaFleur have agreed to part ways it was phrased as a mutual parting of ways. Now, if you followed events through the day on Wednesday, in the late morning, a report came out from a national reporter who indicated that the Jets had fired LaFleur. Then some of the local beat writers pushed back on that. They said that no, de- no decision had been made. However, it was clear from even the local guys that LaFleur was in some trouble because they indicated that the, the decision was still being made, that it wasn't that the Jets had decided to keep LaFleur. It's just they had not made the final decision yet. They were still deliberating. And then in the evening, uh, word got out that the Jets and LaFleur were parting. And again, it was phrased a mutual parting of ways. Now, if you follow this uh, this chain of events, which began in the morning with a national guy saying that the Jets had fired LaFleur, and then it gets denied. And then in the evening, a story breaks that they've decided to agree to part ways that it was mutual and the Jets wanted to bring LaFleur back, but LaFleur wanted to seek other opportunities with other teams. I mean, the picture, to me at least, seems like LaFleur was fired and the Jets tried to let him save face by making it sound like it was his decision to leave. But either either way, the Jets are looking for a new coordinator. Over the last couple of days, I talked about how LaFleur surviving Black Monday was a positive for him because most of the firings happen, happen on Black Monday, but especially the when we get down to assistant coaches, once we get past GMs and head coaches, you're not really out of the woods completely yet because sometimes it takes a couple of days for a change to be made because a coach like Robert Sala, you know, he's been focusing on the opponents. You know, He was focusing on Miami last week. He was focusing on Seattle the week before. He probably has not had a ton of time to put thought into what he wanted to do in the offseason. So there was danger for LaFleur, and it ended up being the case where the Jets are making a change. Now, normally I have a lot of passion when the Jets make a move, when we're talking about a coaching change. You know, I'm either really, really angry about it or... You know, I, I don't ever want to say I'm happy somebody lost their job, but I, I felt that it was very necessary. This is probably the most apathetic I've ever been about a Jets coaching change because I don't think LaFleur really did that good of a job. I don't think he was a great coach. He, you know, he could be a very good offensive coordinator one day, but I think the body of work, there was enough there that a change was justified. And that's true if you look at the Jets' offensive statistics it's also true if you, you look at individual games. I mean, there were some games where he really seemed out of his element. Even in a win against Green Bay, I thought he got way too cute with some of his play calls. I thought he, you know, he tried to tr- tried to impress everybody with with how uh, with 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 his the, some of the gimmicks the Jets were running in that game. And I mean, you could talk the Minnesota games. Uh, there were some very suspect play calls in the red zone in that one. And the Jets ended the season with three straight games without a touchdown, which. I don't care who you are. 
on some level, that has to fall on the coaching. So, yeah, there was enough there that you could have made a move. I, I can't really complain that the Jets have changed offensive coordinators, and I know there are a lot of people who are very happy today. I, I can't get to that point either because, to me, who the offensive coordinator was is almost irrelevant. The Jets' issues were much more about personnel than, there were, than they were coaching this year. Now, of course, there were coaching issues, and I named you some of the individual games where LaFleur did not do very well. I think there are situational play-calling issues that you could point to. I think, again, there were moments where LaFleur got a little, you know, tried to impress us a little bit too much. He tried to show us that he's the smart, hot, young coach. He came up with play designs that he thought were creative. Well, you know, there's a fine line between creative and dumb. And sometimes LaFleur crossed that line. And there were all, there's also some circumstantial evidence that maybe his player management has not been so great. You know, there's nothing, there's no hard data on that, but there, there have been some situations that suggest that might be the case, which would not be that surprising because a guy like LaFleur comes up through Kyle, the, through the Kyle Shanahan tree, and he learns all of these schemes, he learns all of these X's and O's, but a big part of coaching is player management. You don't always learn that. And when you get a job too soon, sometimes that's an area where you struggle. At the same time, again, though, I I can't blame LaFleur when you had this level of quarterback play this year. When you had, and when Mike White was really your best quarterback, and we saw Mike White's flaws quite a bit in the game against Seattle. You know, Mike White's an an NFL quarterback, but I think at this point you'd have to say he's more of a backup than he is a starter, starting quarterback. And you had to start Joe Flacco four games. That's tough to do. And that doesn't even get us to Zach Wilson. And while you would be fair to say that on some level, the offensive coordinator is responsible for the quarterback's development, I find it difficult to put a ton of blame on Mike LaFleur, the fact that Zach Wilson failed to develop at all. And it's because, and it's different with every quarterback. There are some young quarterbacks where I think a failure in the coaching staff has a large degree of responsibility for their failure to develop. But Zach Wilson's just lacking so many of the basic fundamentals of the position. His second game, the second game of his career, he went out and threw four interceptions. That showed you what a project he was. And I think the biggest sin for the Jets was that they failed to realize what an enormous project Zach Wilson would be. And LaFleur probably deserves some blame for that because you don't pick a quarterback second overall unless everybody on the coaching staff signs off on that. So actually, I think it might be fair to say that the biggest criticism of LaFleur might be the fact he signed off on Zach Wilson. It's a tough business coaching. You know, you get fired. If if you're an offensive coach, you get fired when the young quarterback fails to develop. And it's not always your fault. I don't think you could say LaFleur got a fair shake in New York, but at the same time, the coaching profession and the NFL are not fair. And that's, that's just how it goes. When you don't get a, when you don't get performance, it's very easy to get rid of the coaching staff. It's a lot easier to get rid of an, especially an assistant coach. It's a lot easier to get rid of an assistant coach than it is to get rid of all of the players. Now, for the Jets, they're going to need to upgrade their roster because the quarterback position's a mess. And this is where my apathy kind of comes in. Because what they do to upgrade the quarterback position, I think is going to have a much, much greater impact on the 2023 New York Jets than whoever they hire as the offensive coordinator. I think they could have brought LaFleur back, and if they had better quarterback play, LaFleur would have looked better. Same concept as we had with Jeff Ulbrich last year. This time last year, everybody thought Jeff Ulbrich was a terrible defensive coordinator. Well, they got guys who could run Jeff Ulbrich's system, and suddenly Jeff Ulbrich is not on the hot seat anymore. It's a very similar concept. So I think it's much more important that the Jets get a a better quarterback because no matter who they bring in, if they don't upgrade the quarterback position, you're not going to get better results next year. So I think it's a justified move. I I would not have had a big issue with them keeping him. I don't have a big issue with the Jets making a move. To me, this is almost a move that's beside the point. But there are some questions I have about this move, particularly the role of ownership in making the decision for the Jets to move on from Mike LaFleur, because that could have some implications for the franchise as we move forward. And as we continue this Thursday episode of the Locked on Jets podcast, I'll talk about Woody Johnson and why I hope he was not behind this decision. This episode of Locked On Jets is brought to you by Bet Online. Today we're talking about the Jets offensive coordinator situation. The team and Mike LaFleur have parted ways. The Jets will be looking for a new coach to run their offense. However, there are 
12 teams that have a game this weekend as the NFL playoffs kick off on Saturday. They go through Sunday. There's even a Monday night playoff game. And if you want to get away from the Jets and you want to make some money betting on football, you should know that betonline.net is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. You can get all the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there. So it goes beyond pro football. It goes to the NBA. It goes to the NHL. Every sport. They've got it all at betonline.net. And if you love sports podcasts, and of course you love sports podcasts because you're listening to Locked On Jets, you can even find those at BetOnline as well. They are the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online, where the game starts. Today's episode of Locked On Jets is brought to you by Ultimate Football GM. Have you ever dreamed of becoming an NFL GM and managing your football franchise? And maybe you could build a team that does not miss the playoffs 12 straight years. Well, your dream could come true, and this game is definitely for you if that's the case. You can manage every strategic aspect of your team, play through the season, and lead your team to glory. You are responsible for hiring the right coaches and coordinators, trading players, making draft picks, and navigating your franchise through free agency and the draft, and all the ups and downs of a season. All of this comes in a challenging and realistic game world. Ultimate Football GM is completely free and playable offline, on the go, and when and wherever you want to play it. And Locked On Jets listeners can get a 100% free boost to their franchise when using promo code Locked On all caps in the game store. That's Locked On all caps, so make sure to check it out today. And to download the game, just visit ultimate-gm.com or look it up on the app stores. Again, that's ultimate-gm.com. Ultimate Football GM, start your dynasty today. Thank you again for making Locked On Jets your first listener, first watch every day. This podcast is free and available on all platforms. The Jets are looking for a new offensive coordinator after the team and Mike LaFleur decided to part ways yesterday. It was framed as a mutual decision. I don't know about that, but either way, the Jets will be searching for a new offensive coordinator. Now, I do have some questions about the rationale for this change. In the first segment, I talked a little bit about how I feel like there was enough that you could justify a firing. I feel like if LaFleur came back and the Jets fixed their offense personnel-wise, that he would have been fine. I don't really have a lot of passion either way for this decision. I know a lot of people, are most Jets fans seem very, very happy with this decision. I don't, I'm not against it. I just don't think it makes that big of a difference unless the Jets address their personnel. But I do have questions about why this decision was made, because I think the why of this is actually really important for the Jets as we move forward. Now, it's my hope that Robert Sala just felt like this wasn't working and needed to move forward. And that would be a big sign of growth from Sala, because if you know about the relationship between him and, and Mike LaFleur, they were very tight. And sometimes it can be difficult when you have to, when you're a head coach and you hire a friend as an assistant. And by the way, that's why if you're the boss, it's really never a good idea to hire one of your friends because sometimes you, you get to a point where you have to fire them. But something Todd Bowles always struggled with was he had Casey Rogers as a defensive coordinator and they were very close friends. And while the Jets kept going through offensive coordinators, the defense was struggling. Bowles would never make a change. Bowles would never get rid of his friend as the defensive coordinator. And sometimes to grow as a coach, you need to learn that there's business and there's friendship. And it, when you're the head coach, business needs to win out if you're going to be successful. And I think Salah has earned the right, and I think this is true of every head coach. Every head coach should have the right to pick his coaching staff. And the first couple of years, I think for any rookie head coach, any young head coach, you know, for the first year or two, you're kind of figuring out what works and what doesn't. Because I think every coach comes in with a plan, and then they realize, you know, one or two years in, not everything works. Now, hopefully some things work, but not everything works exactly as you were, as you thought it would. And sometimes you need to make adjustments. Sometimes, you know, this hire did not really pan out. Sometimes you need a philosophical change. And listen, next year, Robert Sala's job's on the line. He should be able to bring in the guys he wants. And if there's a course correction here that he felt was necessary, then I think it makes a lot of sense to make the move. My only hope is that Woody Johnson had nothing to do with this thing. And there were, and the reason I say this is there were all kinds of rumors in the final two weeks of the season, how Woody Johnson was angry, how Woody Johnson was going to demand changes. And we know Woody Johnson. This is a guy who meddles, and he meddles in things he has no idea what he's doing on. And I really hope that he did not have anything to do with this change. And I know the natural reaction people always have, and this, is, this happens every time Woody Johnson meddles. If they agree with the decision, they say it's a good thing. Well, he's the owner. He should be able to do what he wants. Well, of course he has the right to do what he wants. He's the owner. But that doesn't just having the right to do something doesn't mean it's a good idea. 
And if you're of the mindset that it's good that the owner came in and demanded an offensive coordinator change because the offensive coordinator was bad and needed to be changed, and that it's good that the owner is imposing his will, well, I have to tell you, I think you're being very short-sighted because, as we know, Woody Johnson has no idea what he's doing. And even when Woody Johnson makes a correct decision, it's almost by accident. It's almost by luck. The question here is whether Woody Johnson's going to let the football people run the operation or whether the owner thinks he knows better than everybody. And listen, I don't know whether Joe Douglas and Robert Sala are going to pan out here. But what I can tell you is that for the New York Jets, it's far better to have the football people making the decisions than it is Woody Johnson. Because when the football people are making the decisions, you at least have a shot. You know, it may not work out, but you at least have a shot. If Woody Johnson is now running the show, then we've got trouble. And that might be an understatement. And I think it, the re, one of the reasons I think it's being very short-sighted to take the mindset, well, I wanted an offensive coordinator change. Woody Johnson, you know, if he did, delivered an offensive coordinator change, therefore it's good, is that Woody Johnson is not going to be able to, to discern when it's right for him to step in and when it's not. It's, it's a situation right now where either Woody Johnson is going to be not involved or is going to be involved. And if you think that, you know, Woody Johnson knows when to pick his spots, well, I refer you to the last 22 years of New York Jets football, especially the last 12. You know, I, will, I, will, I think it actually would be fair to say the first decade was pretty good under Woody, but things have really deteriorated since 2011. And a lot of that's ownership. And really the only thing that's been common since 2011, the only thing that stayed the same exactly since 2011 has been ownership. And I don't think that, that's, I, I don't think that's an accident. And if you think that you know, if you think Woody Johnson getting involved is good, well, you're probably not going to like the next decision he makes or the decision after that, because again, this is not an owner who knows what he's doing. If if the Jets had an owner who had experience building teams and you you knew that he understood how to build a winning franchise, and he steps in and you know he talks to the coach head coach and he says, you know, I don't think this is working. Maybe we should move in a different direction. You know, that's one thing. The Jets do not have that in their owner. The Jets have a guy who even more than two decades into his tenure, and this is something he deserves a lot of criticism for, it feels like he doesn't really, first of all, if you listen to his him talking to the press, it sounds like he really does not understand what's going on when he watches a football game, which is bad. What's worse is that it doesn't seem like he even understands what it takes to build a good organization. Because every single time the Jets have to hire somebody, you know, there's no, there's no, there's no sense in what the ownership is leading it. There's always somebody else who's kind of in charge of things. And after more than two decades, you should have a sense of what you want in a leader of your franchise. So Woody Johnson getting involved is not good because he doesn't know what he's doing. And that's really, again, I think that that's awful considering he's, how long he's owned the team. The fact he has just not learned anything is a really troubling sign. So it's bad if he's getting involved because you may like this decision. I can promise you, you're not going to like every decision that follows. You want him on the sidelines. You want him deferring to the f football, football people. Because even though there's no guarantee Joe Douglas is going to get this right, and even though there's no guarantee Robert Sala is going to get this right, you at least can trust that these guys have experience. Woody Johnson's got no experience. And if he's imposing his will on this team, we're in trouble. Because, because you, and you know this if you follow the team. A dumb decision is and mul or multiple dumb decisions are not far away if this is what's happening. So... My only hope for this, and I, again, I really did not feel passionately about keeping LaFleur, getting rid of LaFleur. I think you could have come up with a justif justification either way. I hope that they, the rationale for this was the right rationale. And I hope this wasn't the case of the owner saying we ended the year on the six-game losing streak. Somebody must be held accountable, so we have to fire somebody. Because it's, it's terrible management technique, the idea that you fire somebody just for the appearance of holding somebody accountable. You know, you, you make changes because they're the right move for your franchise going forward. You don't just create a scapegoat and fire him to make yourself feel better. That's bad management technique, number one. But second of all, more Woody for this team is not good. Now, head here on the Lockdown Jets podcast. We will close out this show and we'll talk about what comes next. We'll talk about some of the decisions Robert Sala will need to make as the Jets, are, as the Jets choose their next offensive coordinator. Today's episode of Locked On Jets is brought to you by Built Bar. Built Bar is the best tasting protein bar on the market. I know we just got through the holidays. And if you want to eat a little bit healthier this year, but you don't want to compromise taste, then you got to try Built Bars. With Built, everything is actually tasty. They are so delicious that you will not think they're good for you. They're perfect for your New Year's resolution. And what makes these bars so good? 
Well, they are all covered in 100% real chocolate, and they come in unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, and coconut almond. These bars taste like candy bars, but they maintain amazing macros. And they're healthy. They're only 130 calories with 4 grams of sugar and 17 grams of protein. So if you don't want to wait around for a box, for years we've been talking about ordering your Built Bars at Built.com, and that's a great option. But now you can also get them at your local Walmart or Sam's Club. That's right. Head to your nearest Walmart today, walk to the pharmacy section, and grab yourself a box of Built Bars. You can, you can pick up a four-bar box of cookies and cream, double chocolate, or coconut puffs. If you're close to Sam's Club, run in and grab a 13-bar box with their flavors, brownie batter and churro. This is the Locked On Jets podcast here on this Thursday. The Jets need a new offensive coordinator. Michael LaFleur is out. The news broke really yesterday morning, and then it was confirmed in the evening that the Jets are looking for a new offensive coordinator. Michael LaFleur will not return to the franchise in 2023. This creates an interesting decision for Robert Sala of where he goes. And this is a critical decision for Robert Sala because his job's probably on the line next year. You know, Salah probably needs, I don't know if he needs to make the playoffs. I think he's got to have a winning record at least. And he might need to make the playoffs. It might be a playoffs or bust kind of year. And that's fair. We're entering year three of Robert Salah's tenure. We're entering year, like technically year five, but really year four of Joe Douglas's tenure. So I think it's fair to ask these guys to make the playoffs uh, and show that, you know, I, I think that that's really the point where you have to say it's time for the Jets to show meaningful progress. And I think playoff expectation is fair. So Robert Salah may be, deciding the coach on the offensive side of the ball who decides whether he stays with the Jets after next season. There are some decisions to make, and obviously LaFleur was very young and did not have a ton of experience when the Jets hired him, so it will be interesting to see whether Salah leans into a coach with more experience. Now, on Monday when he addressed the media, Salah did indicate that he wanted to bring in a coach with more experience, and at the time it sounded like he was talking about bringing in a coach who might be a sounding board for LaFleur. It sounded like they may just be adding an extra coach to help LaFleur out. Well, now it's different. So now the question is whether you're going to go young again at offensive coordinator or whether, and if you do that, then maybe you bring in a coach to help, a, a, more, a more senior coach to help that young coordinator out, or whether you're just going to go more experienced as far as offensive coordinators go. Another question that I have is whether Salah wants to get away from the quote-unquote Shanahan system. Now, Shanahan, the Shanahan offense has become a term that's been come overused. It's kind of become like the West Coast offense where everybody's using elements of it. It's, it's become, it's become a, a phrase that's just beaten into the ground. So, I mean, I, I want to be clear that we're talking about degrees right now, but it would be interesting if Salah goes somebody straight from the Shanahan tree, somebody who's going to run a relatively pure version of the Kyle Shanahan offense, or whether he's going to look to maybe add more variety to the system, you know, maybe depart a little bit from the Shanahan coaching tree. And it'll be interesting because if he goes somebody, if he, if he hires somebody again who's like got direct ties to Kyle Shanahan, that would be a sign that the Jets just believe Mike LaFleur was the issue with the offensive scheme. I mean, that would, be, that would be a pretty clear sign. If you're going to essentially install the same playbook and have somebody new run it, that would be, I think, a pretty clear sign that they just were not happy with Mike LaFleur and they think that just changing play callers is going to fix a lot of their problems. Whereas if they decide to maybe go a little bit away from the Shanahan playbook, it'll show you that maybe there were some philosophical issues that the Jets wanted to change there. I think another question is whether Salah goes with somebody he has direct ties with. Now, it's interesting because Salah has a lot of experienced play callers. There are, there are lots of coaches with uh, play calling experience, offensive coordinator experience, who have worked directly with Robert Salah, and we'll surely we'll talk about some of them in the days and weeks ahead. And there's some, you know, there's even some former head coaches who the Jets may may look at, but there are also guys who have kind of come through the ranks and have plenty of experience. Guys who maybe were uh, more more se more senior guys when Salah was coming coming up through the coaching ranks. Um, it'll be interesting to see whether Salah goes with somebody he knows directly. Now, we know that Salah and LaFleur were always were very tight at the time LaFleur was hired as Jets' offensive coordinator. But an interesting note is that when Salah was hired, he and Joe Douglas had never worked together before. And Joe Douglas was another guy who had some pretty deep ties in the coaching community. Now, Joe Douglas has worked in the front office, but he worked in the Baltimore organization, he worked in the Chicago organization for a year, and he worked in the Philadelphia organization before coming to the Jets. And in that time, he developed a pretty extensive network of coaches. 
when Adam Gase was fired after the 2020 season, it seemed logical that Douglas would look to that, look to his own network, look to guys he had worked with in the past. Instead, though, he kept an open mind, and he ended up deciding that Robert Sala was the right guy for the Jets. And Sala, it, as frequently happens, when he built his coaching staff, there are lots of guys he had worked with before, Mike LaFleur, one of them, Jeff Ulbrich, another. Um, but the question is whether Sala maybe looks to expand his horizons a little bit. There have been some early suggestions that maybe the Jets are going to cast a wide net. And what to me, a wide net, casting a wide net implies is that Sala may go outside his comfort zone. He may try and expose himself to different concepts, to different types of coaches, just as, you know, he and Joe Douglas had never worked together before. Now maybe he looks to find the best offensive coordinator and he, and he discovers that it's a guy he hasn't worked with in the past, and maybe that guy has new, new, fresh ideas. I think one of the challenges when you're building a coaching staff is finding the right balance. You know, the Jets went very young on uh, on their coaching staff when Salah was hired, and that can be a good thing. They, you know, sometimes sometimes younger guys are more receptive to fresh ideas, the more cutting edge concepts. But of course, experience can be helpful as well. On the same note, Salah brought in a lot of guys that he knew in the past, and. That, again, that can be helpful when you're on the same page. A coaching staff is kind of like a team. You need guys who work together really well. It's not always about the biggest name. It's sometimes it's about the getting the right people, getting the right mix, the, the people who will work together, the people who know each other well. But when you have a bunch of people who come off the same coaching tree, sometimes there's a bit of groupthink that comes into play. You know, some, Sometimes you need an outsider's perspective. So I'm going to be interested to see whether Salah maybe leaves his comfort zone a little bit and hires a coach he hasn't worked with in the past to perhaps bring in some fresh ideas. Anyway, that's all for today's episode. This has been the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day is our motto. As always, if you enjoy the show, hit the subscribe button where you are watching or listening so that you'll never miss an episode. If you're listening on a podcast source, please give the show a five-star review. If you're listening on YouTube, please give this episode a big thumbs up. Have a great uh, Thursday, everybody. We'll be back tomorrow to talk more Jets.